Thank you. 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 Thank you
evening and it's good evening to everybody at home as well. Is that the right camera? Yes, right, yeah, or have I been waving at the wrong camera? Um, so hopefully you can all hear me at home um, as well. Um, good evening. Um, I come to you direct from the Aberdeen Science Centre. <laughs> uh, so uh, I have a joyous day today um, uh, celebrating the reopening of the Aberdeen Science Centre. So if uh, any of you have uh, got small people in your lives, um, I can heartily recommend it. It's uh, an amazing new redevelopment. Um, so excuse me if my voice is a little bit hooky. <laughs> um, I've spent all day being excited with small children. Um, so um, I've got various different project talks that I did, and, um, and I gave David the list. And you know, some of them are quite solid research, and he picked this one. So if you're not happy, <laughs> you can blame David afterwards. This is the this is the more sort of thought provoking philosophical one, and I and I genuinely want us to all to have a discussion in it. And that's why it's quite nice that we are actually all in the room together. And hopefully, people at home, you can put stuff into the chat, uh, and David can read it out for us, um, or even even shout out even. Um, so. Uh, when I first started thinking about this idea of the multiverse, you know, it's very much in popular culture, isn't it? The Marvel multiverse. Uh, you've got Voltron is another big kids TV. The multiverse comes up a lot. And when I first started to think about the multiverse, I did not like it. I did not like it one little bit. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know what this idea is, it's that our universe isn't the only universe and that there are other universes out there. And I hated this idea because I thought it is an utterly pointless discussion to even have, because if there are other universes out there, I, I don't care because I can't, there's no way for me to observe them. And so as a scientist, how can I actually test this theory? So I, I anyone mentioned the multiverse, I, I was just like, I love this. But then, you know, I just started thinking some more about it. So, are you going to work for me? <laughs> this is not going to be excellent all right so this is where we are at at the moment with our understanding of the universe right isn't it amazing that i can tell you now with a uh, great detail that 4.9 percent of our universe it's made up of ordinary matter. That's the stuff that a particle physicists can explain that we teach at university. The stuff we understand, 4.9%, 4.9%, you know, accurate, accurate science. And then I can tell you that there is 26.8% dark matter and 68.3% dark energy. And we all do a round of applause at how amazing we have done in astronomy that we can measure these things with the precision of you know, decimal places. Yeah. So that, that's all good. We're feeling very pleased. We're feeling very pleased with ourselves. Until you have to go and actually explain what you do to uh, to your gran or, or your next door neighbour or your cousin or you know anyone who's who's not deeply involved in physics. And they're like, well, that's great, but what is dark matter? And you're like they really know. <laughs> like, oh, what is dark energy? Like, yeah, that one's uh, that one's a bit uncertain as well. Um, so most of my research has been on dark matter, and I actually came here 10 years ago. We don't even know we discussed this earlier, 10 years ago to tell you about my research at that time on dark matter. And um, I'll just show you I'm too far away from it. Um, so this is where I am at, at with my life's ambition of mapping the entire night sky of uh, dark matter. So uh, this is my kit, and I'm very excited to see your kit later on. Uh, <laughs> so this is Paranal, um, and uh, what we've done is we've managed to map out about a fifth of the extra galactic sky. Um, so these pink stripes that you can see across here are what you would see if you could put on uh, your dark matter spectacles to see what it's like. So where there are bright spots, that's where there's lots of dark matter. And as it gets darker, that's less and less um, dark matter. 
and that you know that that represents a good you know that's that's what i've done over the last 10 years since i was last here so <laughs> i can tell you where it is i can tell you how much of it there is but i'm afraid i still can't tell you what it is um and it would be remiss at this point for me uh to pretend that uh, my team is the only team that's doing this uh, so this is a big European project that I've been working on since the last time I saw you. Um, and um, since uh, there is also another team that's been competing with us, um, they're uh, an American team. They've got a bigger telescope than us. You know, you know like everything in America is bigger, right? The, the cars are bigger, the, the Cokes are bigger, the hamburgers are definitely bigger. Telescope's bigger, the dark matter map's also bigger. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, the dark energy survey. Um, it is, uh, this is covering oh, a third of the sky. And look, I mean, this is, this is what you would see if you could put on your dark matter spectrum. It looks a little bit like a tank, but anyway. Um, <laughs> but yeah, can you see that structure in the dark matter? I mean, it's just absolutely stunning. So, all oh, congratulations to my um, American uh, academic cousins uh, for putting this together. Just because it's bigger doesn't mean it's better, but this is a whole other research topic. I wanted to show you kind of where we're at with dark matter, and I, and I do I do think that we will be able to understand this, this part of my cosmic cocktail, sort of what the dark matter particle is. I, I do think our particle physics colleagues will be able to, oh, <laughs> uh, will be able to work that out um, soon enough. Um, but it's this part, the dark energy, is my, is my bit that I'm worrying about the most. So I think that's us out of pretty picture. So we could probably turn the lights back on so the people at home can see me, because I guess it's a bit dark for them. Um, good, all right. Ha, now, now we get some serious physics, ladies and gentlemen. Don't worry. For those, for those of you, some of you in the audience are really happy at this point. Yeah. And some of you are really like, this talk has taken a really bad turn. Don't worry. <laughs> This is Einstein's field of equations and our best ways to explain this mysterious dark energy. You don't need to understand any of the components of it. At all. So those of you who are happy with this, that's fine. You can look through the grade. For those of you who have no idea what's on the board, don't worry. I wanted to put this up here because this is part of my story leading to why I'm getting more excited about the multiverse. All right. Einstein's field equations tell us how everything works in our universe, right? And the terms on this side tell us about how space and time curves. And the terms on this side tell us about all of the mass and the energy in the universe, right? And so the dark matter and the stuff that we're made of is, is over here, and the curvature of space time is over here, right? And you can read this equation in two ways if you read it. Left to right, it's that curved space time tells mass and light how to move in our universe. All right, so all of these terms tell us sort of how that sort of that landscape, if you imagine, I always imagine sort of the gravity is just kind of a landscape of hills and troughs and how the light and matter moves in that, in that space. That's all this side. Um, and the curvature tells the mass and the energy how to move. You can read it the other way as well. That mass and energy tells the space and time how to curve, which is often how I think of it. That if you've got a big clump of dark matter, that curves space and time. <laughs> right, here we go. This is the one bit that I want you to focus on because I think that probably a lot of you will have heard of something called Einstein's cosmological constant. So when we talk about this mysterious dark energy that makes up our universe, our best guess is that it's this term here, this lambda term here in these equations, which is all lovely, very nice, good, problem solved, I can say to my granny. I do understand dark energy, it is the lambda in Einstein's field equations. That doesn't make me very happy. Uh, so for any of you who have, who have taken a course in general relativity, which I know some of you have, <laughs> um, uh, don't worry if you haven't. If you have taken a course in general relativity and you've derived these equations, you'll know that this just comes 
from doing an integral. So if any of you've done calculus, when you do an integral, you always get a, a constant in there. So this is just there from maths, right? So maths tells us that this has to be there. That doesn't make me very happy. I like to have I like to have an origin. Where do these things come from? What what actually is this term? I don't like the fact that it's just there because mathematically it can be and that's what Einstein said it was his greatest blunder <laughs> because he didn't he didn't like the fact that it didn't have an origin um but this in principle could explain dark energy all right so what could be the origin of this this term which uh, would be an energy term so in principle would come on, on the matter which is like right what could it be? All right. So uh, at this point, we need to think about uh, the physics of nothingness, um, also known as the physics of a vacuum, uh, which will lead me to a little side story from the Aberdeen Science Centre today, because <laughs> I just had the best time there. All right. So there, were, um, there was this wonderful, wonderful exhibit where <laughs> they had these two little marshmallows Right. And they put them under a bell jar and then they sucked all the air out of this bell jar. <laughs> oh my God, these tiny marshmallows were like this big. I couldn't believe it. I was more excited than the children about these massive marshmallows in the vacuum. Anyway, it got me thinking about marshmallows in space because most of space is a giant vacuum, right? There are these massive voids out in our universe where there's absolutely nothing. There's no uh, galaxies, there's no gas, there's no dust, a complete void of nothing. There's no marshmallows either. <laughs> All right, so we can understand, we can write down how the physics of this vacuum, this nothingness should work. And uh, quantum physics tells us that actually there's no such thing as a vacuum. Um, if you have a complete vacuum of empty space, you can have these virtual particles that can pop in and out of existence. Um, and this creates energy in a really weird way. All right, so if you just have just a fixed vacuum, um, like the one with the marshmallows in it, uh, then virtual particles pop in and out of existence in equal measure. But if you've got an expanding vacuum, which we have in the universe, because we know that our universe is expanding. If you have an expanding vacuum, then there's more opportunity for the virtual particles to pop into existence than out of existence. It, it takes time to pop back out of existence again. It's a really weird one, but because the universe is expanding, you have more of these virtual particles popping into existence. They give energy to the system, which drives the expansion to get faster. More vacuum, more virtual particles, more energy, more expansion, except it's a bit of a perpetual motion machine, right? So this, oh, this is great. I suddenly understand dark energy. I have a source for dark energy, the physics of nothingness. It can be that lambda term, that cosmological constant in Einstein's field equations, because it behaves like that. Brilliant. Now we can really go and tell my ground that we understand dark energy. And apart from the fact that you can measure this effect, you can measure this quantum effect in a laboratory. And uh, if it behaved in the universe as it does in the laboratory, we would not be here, ladies and gentlemen, because in the very, very early universe, this physics of nothingness would have accelerated our universe at such a rapid speed that the first stars would never have formed. So we're back to square one. All right, so here we go. We're, we're almost at the point of, of going to the multiverse. So we've got some different ideas for what this dark energy uh, could be, what, what could be causing this, this, this origin of this strange dark energy in our universe that we think must be there. All right, so the first one is what I've told you, uh, the vacuum energy, this physics of nothingness, maybe just the particle physicists, the quantum physicists have done their sums wrong, it's all fine. They just have made their measurements wrong. I often like to think that my particle physics colleagues have done something wrong. Uh, I mean, we all we have to do is, is kind of go neutrinos whenever, whenever we talk to them. Um, you know, they made some mistakes in the past. So that's plausible. Um, right, there could be a new weird force field in the universe. We know that there are four fundamental forces. Could there be a fifth? 
Could Einstein's theory of gravity be wrong? That's a whole other seminar. You could invite me back for that on another day. Or the reason why we are here this evening, the multiverse, and the reason why I started to think about the multiverse in, in ways other than just like, I'm not, I'm not thinking about it. So it could be that the particle physicists have indeed done their sums right, but we happen to live in an unusual universe within a multiverse. So the idea here is that you have many, many different universes in a sea of multiverses. The fundamental physics is the same. So there's still gravity, there's still electromagnetism, but the, the way that the sort of the constants for those forces change. So gravity in one universe may be stronger than in another universe. Um, the way that these virtual particles pop into existence and out of existence could be different in our universe than another universe. And so it could be that uh, we are in a very unusual and special universe. So that got me started thinking about modules. So that was a very long introduction to where we are. Um, let me give you some evidence for why we might think there are multiple universes out there. This is, this is, that was my story of how I got there. Um, so that's all we need to define what we mean by our universe. All right. So um, by our universe, I'm going to define it as what we can observe. All right. So uh, we can observe light from uh, that was released after the Big Bang, which was 13.8 billion years ago. So my definition of our universe is a sphere around us here on Earth. Um, with a radius of 13.8 billion light years. Okay, that's gonna be our universe, that's our observable universe. Good. All right, so I can use, I can make measurements in our universe to tell me how much bigger the universe may be beyond our observable universe. Okay, so um, I'll give you an example of this. Um, how do you measure the curvature of the Earth? All right, so if I was just in Hibbs Football Stadium on a big hilly, uh, but um, did we beat Dundee? I think we might have beaten Dundee. We're quite well, high up the league table. Everybody beats Dundee. <laughs> <laughs> there are two teams in Dundee, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, if, if we were just measuring the curvature of the Earth in, in the Hibbs Stadium, um, then we would say that, uh, that the Earth was flat. <laughs> Getting trouble here. Yeah. <laughs> but the earth was flat, but we would have some margin of error on that measurement because we would say, well, we know within the Hibbs Stadium the earth is flat, but we'll have some margin of error there. Uh, maybe we could go to the, the fields of the Netherlands where it's incredibly flat. Uh, we would say, yes, definitely the earth is flat. It goes on and on forever because it's flat, and we'd have some margin of error on that. We can do the same measurement in space. We can say, what is the curvature of the space that we can measure? And we find that it is flat, but we have a margin of error on it, just as we would if we measured the curvature of the Earth in these two situations. So I've made this measurement, lots of other people have made this measurement as well. And our margin of error at the moment means that if our, if the universe that we are living in if it is finite, then there must be at least a hundred other universes within it the same size as our own observable universe. Now that was a bit hard to follow, so let me go through it again one more time. So if our universe, so the universe that our observable universe is within, it must be at least a hundred times larger than our observable universe. That's our current margin of error. On, um, on how flat our universe is. And it could be our theory is actually that our universe is infinite and it goes on forever. But there's at least a hundred times other universes out there the same size of our own. So you might want to call that the multiverse or not, but that's step one. Step one on our journey to thinking about there being multiple universes. All right, step two. Um, Positive toasty in here, David. Positive <laughs> Step two, we're going to have to go back through history a little bit. Um, so this is one of my favourite pictures from 1965 Bell Labs. Um, uh, this is Penzias and Wilson, dedicated to astronomers. Uh, they were working on very early um, 
<laughs> very early mobile phones, basically. <laughs> um, so this was um, a, a microwave um, radio, and they were trying to transmit signals um, across America um, to the, in sort of communication. Um, but they were astronomers as well, so they were working as as, as Bell Lab technicians during the day. And, uh, and they said to their boss, uh, would it be all right if we turned this up? So instead of trying to listen from messages you're sending us across America, would it be all right if we went at night to turn it up and, and have a look at the stars, just to see if stars emit in, in the microwave? Um, and uh, their boss said, sure, whatever. <laughs> so, so off they went, and each night they made maps of, um, of the stars above them. Um, and that was that was great. And they wrote a paper and they said, we have measured uh, microwave radiation from stars. Isn't it amazing that stars emit microwave radiation? And uh, the, the referee, because when we when we write papers, we always get a referee report. Uh, the referee came back and uh, and I was going to say he said it probably was he said in those days. Anyway, they said <laughs> it was an anonymous referee. They said, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. What if it's just some crud? In your telescope, what I want you to do is I want you to point it away from the Milky Way and you should detect less submillimeter radiation away from the from the Milky Way. So point it at the, at the Milky Way, you're detecting the submillimeter from the sorry, the, the, the millimeter of radiation from the stars. Point it away from the Milky Way, you should see nothing. And they're like, oh, all right, that's easy, that's easy, we'll do that. They pointed it away, oh, I measured a signal. Oh yeah, rats! It's just it's just the telescope that's rubbish. They did all sorts of things. There's a very very long list of all the different things that they did to try and uh, get rid of this this noise, this terrible noise in the background that meant that they were worried that they weren't actually detecting the light from the stars. And my favourite story is they donned hazmat suits and went inside this to clean out all the pigeon food. That's my absolute favourite story out of all of it. Uh, can you imagine they, when they turned it on that night after spending all day cleaning out pigeon food? Like, still there. <laughs> uh, there we go. So this is what it looks like now. This is using the Planck satellite. Um, the beautiful purple stuff that you can see here that is the um, microwave radiation from the stars that they were trying to measure. And this pink stuff that you can see in the background here, that was what they were trying to get rid of. Um, the story goes that they were friends with um, some people at the Advanced Institute for Studies in Princeton, and they'd gone over to have a cup of tea with them in the morning, and they were regaling this story of cleaning this pigeon poo out of their telescope and how it's still what still was a problem and that they were never going to get their paper published and this is terrible. Uh, when uh, Jim Peebles uh, was a young man at the time was over, over was listening and, uh, and he says, yeah, hang on, what have you detected? And they're like, oh yes, it's microwave radiation absolutely everywhere. And he's like, that's exactly what we predict from the Big Bang. <laughs> so um, yeah, this is, uh, uh, this, is a TV show that you may be familiar with. Um, my sister, I, I, my sister asked me if I watched this show, and I didn't watch it because I don't have a television. But I just got the picture up, and I was like, "Oh, do you think that, that that's me?" And she was like, "No, that one's you." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I, I, "Anyway, I watched an episode and I wasn't very impressed." <laughs> anyway, so Big Bang Theory: the idea is the universe starts in the Big Bang. Um, and um, that causes our universe to expand, and we see that expansion still today. Um, and this Big Bang Theory predicts that you should see this perfect um, black body uh, radiation, this heat that's left over from the Big Bang. And that's just, it was so hot and dense after the Big Bang, and as the universe expands and cools, then you see it, uh, the light, that radiation that's left over after the Big Bang gets cooler and cooler, and you get the microwave radiation uh, that they were, that Ken Dyson and Wilson were seeing everywhere across the sky. So, big, big discovery, slash next piece of evidence for the multiverse, right? <laughs> Here we go. This one's another one, to, tricky one to get your head around. Uh, so this is called the horizon problem, and, um, here I have Sheldon 
from the Big Bang on planet Earth. And he is going to look in one direction over here, and he is going to measure the microwave radiation that's been left over from the Big Bang. Okay? And he measures that it has a temperature of 2.74 Kelvin. Good. Now, this light has taken the whole age of the universe to reach Sheldon here on Earth. Right, so there's a certain distance that it's taken to reach him, and that's 13.8 billion light years. Good. All right, now he's going to make a measurement in the exact opposite direction, and he's going to find that the microwave radiation in that direction is also 2.74 Kelvin, exactly the same. And we know that that light has taken another 13.8 billion years to reach us because it's, it's left over from the Big Bang. All right, so 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 far, so good. Except, how did this side of the universe know to be exactly the same temperature as this side of the universe? Because the distance between those two parts of the universe, there just simply hasn't been enough time for information to be transmitted from one side to the other, unless. Sheldon is right bang slap in the epicenter of the Big Bang. Right? If the Big Bang emanated from Sheldon, then yeah, fine, everything goes out in both directions. Um, but if you want to be a cosmologist, then you have to join the gang of, uh, of saying, I'm not special. That's, that's sort of the first rule of, of becoming a cosmologist. You have to say, I'm not special. I'm not in a special place in the universe. So why would we be at the epicenter of the Big Bang? Um, to help explain this with analogy, it's like um, right, it's like if you're trying to organise a party, all right, with all of your friends, and it's and it's not a pandemic anymore, so you can organise a party with all of your friends, but your friends don't know each other, all right. So you contact them all individually, but they don't know each other at all, and you say, "Come to my house around seven o'clock," right? But then all eighty of your friends arrive at 6.53 and all of them are wearing mauve. And you think to yourself, how on earth did these guys and gals all connect with each other to tell each other to arrive at 6.53 wearing mauve? <laughs> it's, they must have somehow got connected with each other to, to, to wind you up. So the fact that everywhere we look in the universe tells us that it all must have been connected at some point in the past. All right. So either we are at the epicenter of the Big Bang and everything was connected around us and then blew away from us, or something strange has happened. And this is sort of a cornerstone of physics um, that, uh, yeah, that's what I said, good. Um, a cornerstone called inflation, All right? So this is sort of really fundamental early physics of our universe. And it's, it's still very theoretical, but it's an absolute cornerstone of how we think our universe works. Um, and the idea is that after the Big Bang has happened, the universe experiences an incredibly, incredibly rapid period of inflation. And that's, that very rapid period of inflation changes us from a, a very small universe where everything was connected into the incredibly large universe that we see today where different parts of the universe are no longer connected, um, but they were once. And that's how everything looks the same for us today. Now, this theory of inflation is, is very, very strange. It's very, very strange. My best way to try and explain what's going on with this incredibly rapid period of inflation is to, is to take, take you back to when you were very little before you understood about gravity. All right, so um, I want you to imagine, well, I'll take yourself back to your youth, right? You're sat on a hill, right? And you're, you're looking out onto the, into the view and you've got a truck next to you. One of your trucks is next to you. And you're just sitting admiring the view and all of a sudden your truck just starts to slowly roll down the hill all right and it's going to pick up energy and it's going to pick up speed and, and this you don't know about gravity there's no batteries in there and you're just like oh my goodness my truck has just started moving on its own it's just got energy from nowhere now you're grown up now and lots of you are physicists and you're all astronomers so you all know about gravity what's happening there is just the gravity is pulling your truck down the hill. The, the force field of gravity is giving energy to your truck. Uh, inflation is a bit like that. <laughs> so 
After the Big Bang, the idea is that our universe is so hot and so dense that the physics that we know and love now behave very differently. One idea is that the four fundamental forces that we know and love were all unified in a single force. And that single force gave a whole ton of energy to our universe, just like that truck got energy from the gravity to roll down the hill. All right, what's going to stop your truck from moving when it gets to the bottom of the hill? Right, the, the hill will, will plateau out or something, or it will smash into a wall, that would be a shame. But some, something's going to stop your truck rolling down the hill. What stops our universe inflating? So we believe that, that this universe, or that our universe had this very rapid period of inflation, but what made it stop? And this is, this is the big question. And unfortunately, the best answer, 90% of different theories to explain this, this strange phenomenon in our very early universe, 90% of them predict that in order to stop our universe inflating, another two universes need to be created. This is called chaotic inflation theory. This is not me making it up. <laughs> Uh, the majority of fundamental theories to explain this, this cornerstone inflation period in, in our universe's history that we teach at undergraduate, right? So, you know, it's, this, is, this is not mad physics. 90% of those predict that you don't just create one universe, you create multiple universes. To stop one inflating, you need to start another two. To stop those two inflating, you need to start another two, another two. And so it grows and grows. And you end up with this sort of bubble-like hypothesis, bubble-like scenario with lots and lots of different universes being created in series. Oof. How are we doing, David? Is everyone, we, we haven't even finished yet. There's more. <laughs> What's the time, David? Uh, just 10 minutes. All right, okay. What was the time? It's right. Your third piece of evidence for there being a multiple so that is we're here, we exist, right? Um, there are four fundamental forces in our universe: gravity, electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. And we have a really good fundamental understanding of the the way that these different forces behave. We can understand them mathematically and theoretically. We have a good reason, you know, the, the, the fact that gravity reduces the further away you are from uh, the, the source of mass. These things we can really explain. One thing we can't explain is the strength of the gravity. You know, why, why is gravity 9.8 meters per second? There's no like fundamental reason for why it has that parameter. Um, and it turns out the, the sort of the, the numbers, the numbers associated with these forces are very, very finely tuned. Let me give you some examples. All right, so the electromagnetic force, so the electromagnetic force is what uh, binds protons and electrons together. It's what makes light travel. If you change the, uh, the charge of on an electron, the electromagnetic force by 4%, the sun would explode. <laughs> Those very fast fusion reactions would happen so quickly, it would simply explode. Okay. That would be bad. Just 4%, very small change. And then if you, the strong nuclear force is what governs what's happening inside um, an atom. So if you weaken the strong nuclear force by 2%, then there will be no hydrogen remaining after the Big Bang. So after the Big Bang, lots of hydrogen is created. It starts fusing together to make helium. Um, that helium fuses together to make beryllium, lithium, but eventually it stops. And if you change that strong nuclear force by just 2%, then all of the hydrogen would be used up to make helium, and you never get any stars forming. You need the hydrogen to make the stars. No stars, no planets, no life. Hmm. Um, all right, this DNA. DNA is really sensitive to how things work. If you increase the mass of an electron just slightly, DNA wouldn't form. If you decrease the mass of an electron, then stars wouldn't form. The electron is very finely balanced. Here's, here's a killer. If you increase or decrease the mass of a proton by 0.2%, then no atoms would form at all. 
Ooh, hmm, conspiracy? Hmm. <laughs> and then we return full circle to where I was at the beginning, this, this physics of nothingness. Um, if the vacuum in our universe behaves like we think it should, we wouldn't be here. So, so maybe, uh, what you, why does the vacuum energy not behave like that? Uh, we're here, so we know there are galaxies and atoms and a, an observable universe. Uh, but, but why is that? So um, here are the three things that I have gone through. Um, we know there's at least 100 universes as large as our own. If, if the, there was an almighty universe that was finite, it's got to have at least 100 universes the size of our own observable universe. So you could think of that as a multiverse if you like. The consequence of inflation theory, that fundamental theory to explain our universe, that's really a cornerstone of astrophysics, that actually predicts that there should be multiple universes out there. And the fact that you exist, this is called the anthropic argument, our universe does appear to be very fine-tuned for us to be here, but maybe it's not a fine-tuning, maybe it's just in all of these different realizations, all of these different multiple universes, there are lots of different realizations of the different fundamental forces. And of course, of course, we would be in the one that was fine tuned for life. Of course, we would be in the one. So, well, so I did all that. I did all that thinking. I thought, oh dear, well, I'm going to have to start thinking properly about the multiverse now. So, can we actually test it? You know, I started at the, said at the start, I don't, I don't want to think about it because I can't test it, but you can, right? Because we can test this inflation theory. So this inflation theory that predicts these multiple universes, that is actually something we can test in lots of different ways. Um, so, oh, other worlds, mm, this is where it gets totally crazy for me. I forgot I even put this slide in. <laughs> we can discuss this. Some people take this whole idea to a whole new level, <laughs> which is called the other world scenario. So this is Schrodinger's equation written in terms of cats. <laughs> um, so Schrodinger's cat is, of course, the, the, the lovely quantum physics experiment, which says if you put a cat in a box, you don't know if it's dead or alive until you look. And that's the same with quantum physics. So electrons behave really differently. Sometimes they behave like particles. Sometimes they behave like waves. And you don't know what it's going to look like until you look. So the art of looking is almost defining reality. And some people say, well, uh, People don't like this. They don't like the fact that when you look, you change something, you make a decision. And so some quantum physicists say that actually both realities happen. The cat lives and the cat dies. But when that decision is made to look in the box, the universe splits. And in one universe, the cat lives. And in the other universe, the cat dies. And you may be in one or other of those realities. This, in my opinion, is taking things very far, but I would love to discuss it all with you this evening. All right, so uh, our topic of discussion is, is this a credible version of the universe or just crazy mathematics um, gone wrong? Um, I'll just leave you with the very awesome Vera Rubin Observatory, which is my new mm -hmm. baby at the moment, um, awesome. which um, I think is going to be able to help us test these inflation theories. It's also going to help us look for bubbles, like if there was another universe colliding with our universe, we should be able to see that in kind of ripples. These are things we, we do actually look for this. It is lots of fun. And um, this is an artistic impression of what it's going, what we want it to look like. Here's it in May 2018. Uh, this is August 2018, building up. Um, July 2020, unfortunately, tools down um, during the pandemic, but we are getting there. And this was it just last night. So we are very almost there. Should be first light. It was supposed to be first light now, um, but it's going to be first light in uh, sort of mid, mid to the end of next year. This is a completely awesome piece of kit. I'm super excited about it. It's an 8.4 metre telescope. The camera is the size of Fiat Punto. We've got two Guinness World Book records already, for the largest camera in the world and the largest lens, which is 1.7 metres across. This thing is phenomenal. It is going to give us the deepest, widest image of the universe that has ever been taken. And that allows us to actually test out these crazy theories, <laughs> which are fun. And uh, 
and some of you are smiling at me and others of you are still like no we're not discussing the multiverse now. there you go um it's not just that though we are also going into space here we go this is our other baby this is euclid uh, it's going to be launched at the end of next year uh same idea deep sky observations super exciting uh the two of them working together so i think i will leave it there um if you are interested in more things to read this is my book it's free uh, uh so check out that one you can just google me in dark universe these two are not free but they really inspired me when i wrote this talk and particularly this one by max tigmark um our mathematical universe it's a really it's a really good one if you're looking for if people are asking you what you want for Christmas, um, this one's free, so go and ask for that one. But I do recommend um, Max's book because it's um, it really inspired me to write this talk. So there you go. Why do you? Hello, everyone at home. <laughs> oh, Catherine, thank you ever so much. And um, this all sounds like far too much fun. <laughs> Um, does anyone have comments or questions they would like to pose just now? Okay. Well, I had trouble with Gus and Clayton City when I first came across it. Yeah. And I kind of got used to the idea it worked. But I did wonder why the inflation occurred and then stopped. Yes. And now that you, I, I can't quite get my head down the idea of two universes. Did they appear and stop it? Or the stopping creating the universes. Yeah, so, so one way to think about it is um, if you've played snooker, that you can have a ball rolling along and you've got another two ball, balls waiting, and that ball, when, when the ball that's rolling along hits the other two, it stops and the other two yeah. go off. It's that sort of idea. Um, so that's, I mean, <laughs> that's tricky because you're thinking about balls rolling along in space. And one, thing I have trouble with getting this around in my head is are these sort of bubbles in space and time or are they in different dimensions so that's another idea that they could be living in different dimensions um, but just in terms of yeah how do you, that, the big question is how do you stop inflation and and this is one of the ways that you can do it is by moving that energy that force field to somewhere another point in space and time to kick start inflation there um yeah, I mean it blows my mind. <laughs> Why is it two? Well, it, in some theories isn't so I, I should repeat the question for people at home, shouldn't I? Um, the question was why is it two? It doesn't have to be two. So you could have you could have more going as well, but the yeah, it's the I mean that analogy of the snooper is, is a good way of thinking of it. Um but yeah, you, it, it doesn't, and these chaotic inflation theories, there are oodles of them. I mean, the, the theoretical physicists, I do love them, but they do write <laughs> a lot of papers. It's like, what would it be like if we had four? What would it be like? If, yes. <laughs> give, give me an observable that I can test. So that's like, when I got real, more reading into this, I just, loved, I, what I wanted was observations that I could actually test. You know, that was that was the reason why I hated it in the first place because I thought I couldn't ever test these theories. Mm. But you can test, I can test this idea of inflation because I can look at the radiation from the Big Bang. You can look for ripples in that. Um, yeah, the idea of if there are bumping, bumping universes, you would see that in, in the distribution of the galaxies. And with Ruben, we're going to be mapping out where all of the galaxies are out to, uh, gosh, about 10 billion light years away. You know, it's it's you know, we're really doing these immense charting of the universe. And so we should be able to see these really intricate patterns if they're there. Um, so it's yeah, it's well, it's fun, isn't it? I mean, what's the point of doing anything if it's not fun? Yeah. <laughs> Just a, a brief comment. When Penzias and Wilson were talking about removing the pigeon poop, yeah. I referred to it as white dielectric material. White dielectric material. I repeat that for the for the people who apparently Penzias and Wilson called it white dielectric material. So rather I I I, I lowered the tone in the room by calling it pigeon poop. I'm sorry. But white dielectric material from henceforth. <laughs> Question kind of related to the, uh, the the standard cosmological model is that I've been reading recently that there are 
interesting observations which kind of contradict what you might call the standard model Whoa. um with the, the sort of lambda cdn and that well, i'm asking about my very own research david welcome <laughs> <laughs> It's just something I've been seeing quite a lot of it in. And oh, apparently the, the, yes. the homogeneity of the universe, it should it shouldn't allow big structures to exist beyond a certain size. And yet there are a lot of big structures which may imply that the the, the lambda CDM isn't quite as uh, so for those who haven't heard this term lambda CDM, that cosmic cocktail that Pie chart I showed you at the start mm. that the colloquial term that is lambda CDM. So I showed you the lambda in the in the Einstein's field mm. equations, and the CDM stands for cold dark matter. So lambda CDM just means dark matter and dark energy. So uh, can I show you to this? Let me go back to our right. The cosmic cocktail. All of the um, well, people at home are gonna. Now. Right, here we go. <laughs> this is a map of the cosmic micro background that comes from the Planck satellite. All right, so this is what it's like. I like to think of this as kind of like a war map. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll explain what's going on. So right after the Big Bang, um, so inflation has happened, um, and you have this battle going on between matter and light, which is strange to think about. So for us, you know, we're made out of matter and light doesn't bother us at all. But in the very early universe, it's so hot and so dense that there's so much light that it can actually shunt matter around, which is really strange. So when you see red spots here, this is a victory for the matter, right? So the gravity of the matter is pulling everything together, right? And that heats up the light just slightly and makes the light slightly hotter. And when you see a blue spot, this is a victory for the light. Okay, so what's happened here is the gravity's tried to pull the mass all together. The light's got too hot and gone, no, and pushed it back out again and cooled off. So this really is a battle map of the universe right off the Big Bang. Matter win, light win. Okay, so this is your battle map. Now, that whole story I just told you about gravity and light tells us everything we need to know about what the universe is made up of. And that's where that cosmic cocktail pie chart comes from. So these distributions of red spots and cold spots tells us exactly what this makes up the universe. But that tells us about what the universe is like right after the Big Bang. And then we can predict what it, the universe looks like today. So the big maps of dark matter that I showed you I'm going to show you my one, not the American one. <laughs> when we look at how the, the dark matter is distributed today, it actually doesn't agree with the predictions from that cosmic cocktail. So I, I, I skipped this one out because that's a whole other talk, David. <laughs> but this is my research at the moment. And so if, you, if you've read stuff in New Scientists, they call it tension cosmology. Um, uh, there's, there are various quotes from me. A lot of people have been telling me I've been doing things wrong for a long time because uh, our maps of dark matter don't agree with these predictions of what the universe should look like. It's only a little weak disagreement. It's, it's small, but enough to start getting worried about. So that cosmic cocktail I showed you at the start is fantastic, but not only do we not know what the dark matter is, and we don't know what the dark energy is. Actually, it doesn't explain our universe as well as we thought of it. So in some ways, a bit of an epic fail. In other ways, look how much of the sky I've mapped out since I last came to know. <laughs> I mean, last time I was here, I'd only done like a tiny bit like this, and that was the biggest dark matter map of, of the time. So progress. Uh, <laughs> it was sore. But do you know what? I mean, I think it just shows us that we're missing something really big here. You know, and, and that's so exciting, isn't it? That you know, for so long we've had these four fundamental forces in our universe, but to, to, to make them explain the observations that we're making, we need to invent dark matter and we need to invent dark energy, and but we don't understand them. So, what are we missing? You know, it, is it we're in, in one crazy universe in a sea of multiverses? Possibly. Is it that Einstein's theory of gravity isn't complete? Possibly. Is there another fifth force? I don't know, but this this is why I'm so excited and so passionate about our research, 
because it is really probing these really big questions. Um, and I do worry that I'll get to the end of my career and I'll retire and I'll go, oh no, I've been telling people all my life that there's this dark matter and dark energy and, and they're just going to be our ether. You, you know, the, back in the day, they invented the ether to explain light. And then James Scott Maxwell came along and, and really explained light. <laughs> so uh, could, could it be their, their ether of, of the 21st century? Um, who knows? I don't, we just need our particle physics cousins to find the darn dark matter particle, and then that's at least one of the list. <laughs> Uh, was there anyone at home? Did anyone no, at home want to no, ask anyone? No questions on the chat on Zoom or on YouTube. I think they're uh, somewhat. Is, is everyone who would normally ask the questions here well, in the room? There is, there is uh, one guy who usually asks the questions. If anyone at home wants to answer the question, please do go ahead because David can read it out for you. Oh. Could you explain? Yeah, with your, you know, with ether, you mean the ether. I mean, that's your roadmap, isn't it, to whether the ether is right or wrong. So, yeah. I mean, that, it's a very important thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, I, I don't, I don't, we, we've never said that there definitely is a dark mass particle and there definitely is, dark, you know, that is our theoretical model to yeah, explain yeah. our observations yeah, yeah. now. And our job is to try and prod it and poke it. And, you know, the, these maps of dark matter, you know, it's something it's, it's, you know, 10 years ago, it was just the very start when we were making those measurements. And now we can do this routinely across the whole sky. And the more, the more and more data you get, then you start finding the, the chinks in the armor, what's wrong, what's wrong, and it makes you question even further. Was yeah, there a question at home? Question, oh, yeah. good. If we well, a request, could you explain the curvature concept again? Oh, just curvature, no, it's, it's a really tricky one. It's a really tricky space. one, yeah. So I think everyone's happy with this idea of the curvature of the Earth, because clearly we don't live on a flat Earth, no matter how many people like to tell me that we do. Good. Um, so the curvature of our Earth, if you head off in one direction, you will eventually come back on yourself again. So that is looking at the curvature of a two-dimensional surface. And now somehow in our brains, it's impossible for our brains to do this, but now we have to go through curvature from a two-dimensional surface to the curvature of in actually four dimensions because we've got space and time and actually do you know what it's impossible to do that in your head but it's the same idea if our universe was finite then if we set off in one direction we would eventually come back on ourselves again just like we do you know, on the surface of the earth um, and if our uh, universe was finite, then because we've made measurements of how flat it is in our own observable universe, we know that it has to be at least 100 times larger than our own observable universe, but actually could be even bigger. So most theories say that the universe is actually infinite. So if we head off in one direction, we would never, ever come back on ourselves again. So that's what an infinite space is. But it is it's impossible to get your head around David <laughs> and whoever's asking at home it's a really hard one just sort of yeah thinking about well if it well so if it was finite yes then you would apply only one universe but it has to be, but it's a very 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 big universe yeah. and we've got another uh, couple of questions mm -hmm. from uh, YouTube um, what does it take to map the dark matter to measure it and why does it take so long to measure it <laughs> why, did it, why did it take you so long Catherine come on <laughs> uh, so this is a whole other talk and um, so I use a technique called gravitational lensing um, so uh, the idea so these measurements that you see here um, we've used about this is 30 million galaxies um, that we use their light has traveled about 7 billion light years towards us and each time that light goes past a clump of matter, it gets just slightly bent and distorted. So when I look up at all of the images of these galaxies, I see that they're just very weakly aligned with each other. And that's just because, so uh, you can be the black, or so you can be the lump of matter, right? If I've got two galaxies here, when their light's traveling towards you at the back, it's gonna be bent and distorted around you, okay? And then so the shapes of the galaxies are going to be slightly distorted in the same way. So what I'm looking for when I look at these galaxies is I look to see just a very weak alignment. 
the stronger the alignment, the more stuff I know it's there. So one of these hotspots here, the galaxies behind that hotspot are really aligned with each other. And that's just the gravitational effects of the curvature of space and time. Now, why does it take so long? That is a good question. So when you're looking for very tiny distortions in the shapes of galaxies, you really need the atmosphere to behave itself. So we're in power now for this. So we're already in one of the darkest skies that they can possibly be. We are high up above the mountains. Um, but still, uh, we need the absolute best observing conditions. And we were really lucky the European Southern Observatory said whenever the weather was good, they would take our data. Um, so yeah, for, for yeah, 10 years, we've been tracking this patch of sky. Basically, just whenever, whenever the moon was down, whenever the scene was perfect, they would take our data. And um, also, we don't just take uh, data in just one color. We do nine different colors. So we do um, all of the optical colors and the near infrared colors. So we actually use two telescopes for this. Um, we use one optical and one near infrared telescope. So map this patch of sky actually nine times in different colors. Mm -hmm. And that helps you find out where the galaxies actually are, because the further away they are, the redder they are. So we can use their colours to work out the distances. So that's the longer talk in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a lot of indirect measurements. Yeah. That take a lot of time to build up. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. that's what it's saying. Yeah. I'm just saying one thing I found that I don't think I've got time. That I can find that there is multiverses. What? Yeah. Gradually bubbles. Yeah. And so in between those bubbles, there's these massive bubbles that we can't imagine how big as there's nothingness, which doesn't count as universe. But we can't travel outside our universe to get to it, never mind through it to another universe. Or is there some kind of spot spear type parallel universe? That's yeah, so that's so if these the, these theories can't it can't tell us that. But you could and any kind of the, the other world's sort of ideas, these sort of these science fiction. So I use the spot so, spear now. <laughs> The famous episode of Star Trek, another spot Yeah. So I mean, the, the other world scenario makes quantum physicists happy because they don't like that. They call it the wave function collapse. That that's when you make a decision. And quantum physicists really don't like the fact that a decision has been made. So they like this idea of both both realities happen. And in that scenario, sort of, ah, oh, have you seen them? Um, his, his, his great his, materials, his dark materials, his dark materials yeah. on um, uh, the BBC, and they have the, the, they have sort of these parallel universes yeah. all sort of lined up. So that's sort of one idea of think of this other world that they're just sort of kind of all stacked up on each other. I, well, I, I thought I mean, I always thought Scrooge's scrunch, cat was, was to disprove because the cat can't be alive and dead at the same time. It's impossible. And this is the idea that just, I mean, it's a, it really didn't mean, apparently it didn't really do it, it's a theoretical. Yeah, it didn't yeah. actually kill a cat. <laughs> poison, it, it was some, the, the theory was that somebody would play poison in the box and, and it would be released, you know, depending on how you look, well, how you look, yeah. or, you know, you know and, then, and then, so the cat would have to be in the box and alive and dead at the same time. And this was him saying, well, that's why it's rubbish. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a way that it really he's trying to describe so the electron. He wasn't trying to prove something; he's trying to disprove something. Yeah, it, it was an analogy. Yeah. it's an analogy that 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 when you do these these quantum experiments, yeah. I'm sure two things that, I'm, could happen. I'm sure I read that in a book called The Science of Science Fiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, you know, a lot. Of I did say I did start this talk by saying this is one of my more far out talks. But I think yeah. it's just good to think about that these. Yeah. These different realities can happen, and, and I, I, now I've sort of come more to terms that I feel actually quite relaxed because it means that you know if we if we do something wrong, another reality has done something right, so we can kind of chill a bit. Professional astrophysics criticists to write that some of these science fiction shows are going to turn into documentary. <laughs> I think it's really interesting the interaction between science fiction and science. So um, one Sorry, classic example that. of this is uh, NASA is about to um, smash a mission called DART oh, into yeah. uh, Dimorphos, which is uh, uh, two asteroids that are orbiting each other. It's Didymus and Dimorphos, and they're going to crash into the moon. And then um, 
I just think this is fantastic. I mean, it's it's, it's absolutely textbook out of Armageddon yeah. with Bruce it's, Willis. It's, you know? it's, 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 it's brilliant. It's brilliant. <laughs> but you know what? We need to do this. We need to do this sort of experiment because there will be an asteroid that comes in our direction at some point. I mean, hopefully not many, many, many thousands of years. But I just think it's fantastic that NASA's actually doing these <laughs> these tests just to see if you can do it. I like. I hope it works. Yeah. It's not very heavy what they're crashing into it, by the way. No, it's, it's yeah, about they're fast. They're going to be super fast, fifteen thousand miles per hour, and it's about the weight of a Harley Davidson. Another another question. Uh, yeah. Will Will James Webb Space Telescope? Oh, we haven't even. Oh, let's oh let's have some let's have some excitement yeah. about James Webb Space Telescope. Is it going to help? In uh, it is not it. going to help my yeah. work. So, as you can see, my stuff is all about big, big sky. We are thinking about the universe as a whole. Hell, we're thinking about other universes outside of our own universe. So, my work is very much looking at uh, big, big scales. And James Webb Space Telescope is absolutely awesome, but it is very focused on really sort of pencil beam looks through the universe, looking incredibly deep into the universe. It is going to be absolutely amazing though. So it should be able to see the very first stars and galaxies that have been born. It will be looking back to the universe about 300 million years after the Big Bang. Only the ones in our universe. Only the ones in our universe, yeah. No, it can't see ones in other universes. You're quite right, sir. <laughs> um, it is also going to be looking at other planets orbiting stars. So it's going to have one of the most powerful, it's called a coronagraph. So that's when you block out the light from the star and then you can look at the planet that's going around. And most excitingly for me, it is going to be measuring the weather on some of these planets. So you can look at how the weather is changing on these planets by looking at the spectroscopy and just seeing how the different, so the higher or lower the clouds are on the planet, it changes the spectroscopy light from these planets. I just think this is so exciting that civilizations on planet Earth can go and measure the weather on other planets. No, it is also so I mean December 18th, just cross your finger that yeah. nothing goes horribly wrong because if it does that's that's a 10 billion pound bonfire on the, yeah. on the launch pad. <laughs> There's a lot of Edinburgh on board, isn't it? So, so um, Edinburgh was, so the European um, leader of the MIRI um, instrument is uh, Professor Julian Wright, who is the director of the ATT in Edinburgh. I'm starting to read it. Uh, yeah, it's 22, so the taxi's coming in about 10 minutes. Oh, right, crikey, right, right, taxi's coming, people. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think we're probably good. Thank you so much. Great right. right. to meet um, It's an absolute pleasure. <laughs> um, slightly bends your head. A bit, so, um, um, nonetheless, <laughs> what fun. <laughs> it's just what fun. This is fantastic. What happened? Next, so what's your next goal? Oh, right. So, um, my big I haven't even started talking to you about my telescope project. So, at some point, I am in fact, I will write that for your new setup, yeah, sure. because I'm going to need your guys' help. Um, because so, what, what, what I want to do is get some telescopes in all of our outdoor centers in, um, in Scotland. So, we have all of these fantastic residential centers, which the majority of our primary school children visit. Um, they're there for a whole week, so I mean, you're you're all professional astronomers <laughs> you know what the weather's like so yeah. it's better than nothing they may still be weathered out for the whole week but it, there should be fingers crossed one night that it's that it's clear uh, so we're going to get uh telescopes installed for all of these um, places so everything's delayed because of the pandemic of course and um, so we're just thinking about what what sort of telescope we want um do we want a dobsonian like the, the thing we've got upstairs that requires a lot of training for the people there or do we want to get one of these really high-tech ev scopes where you, it's just plug and play they're much more expensive but it's much less training um but if this is going to work i'm going to be relying on fantastic groups like you uh to because to be able to go to these residential centres and just show the people how things work, you know, um, because you know, there are amateur astronomy groups across all of Scotland, 
you'll be much nearer some of the residential centres than I will be, and um, and you all absolutely you actually know much more about astronomy than I do. <laughs> um, so uh, it's still early days. Um, we are actually just putting in a grant proposal to SGFC for a big chunk of money to. to to get its seed corn funding and then um, I have some nice philanthropists who said if I can show that it works they might give me some big money for it so mm -hmm. um, but we're going to do a trial run first but I'm going to be relying on people like you to, to help me make it happen I mean you're very lucky here you have the mills and all of Dundee who come here but uh, a lot of children really never get the chance to look through the telescope and, and I suppose here you're relying on parents bringing them here so this is one way that we can make sure that every child gets the opportunity to look through a telescope whether their parents are interested or not and so yeah so that's the next big project if but you know there's so much there's I, I want to find out what this is that's why there's so much to do <laughs> three children we, we'll get there eventually <laughs> That sounds pretty exciting, actually. That would be really yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. 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 Who's it really a childish question? If we put the Prime Minister Green in a bell jar and suck out the edge, we'd have to help, couldn't it? Could get bigger. They were so big, those marshmallows. I'm so trying. I've got a voice in the space. Yeah, no, I've been sorry. I think with this bell, I thought that would be a